This is Mrs. Murphy and today we're going to learn a little bit about file structures. We're going to learn about FAT and NTFS file structures. We're going to talk about sequential versus random access files and then we're going to show you some hashing algorithms. You ever need to keep track of anything? How about your keys? Your phone? What about that remote control? I know where our mine always is. It's always underneath the couch. You spend more time looking for the remote control than actually watching TV. Well, what about something more extensive? What if you're organizing patient files in a doctor's office? Well, hopefully you'd have something better than the storage system in this, this filing cabinet shown here. Uh, this is pre-computer hard drive right there. Well, that's the job of a computer is to organize and find files. A computer has to keep track of tons of information. Not as only does it store your files, your music, your videos, your pictures, but it stores all of the files for the operating system. In order to accomplish this effectively, the computer needs some sort of file system that keeps track of all the files and the information on the computer. A computer's way of organizing the data is similar to our filing cabinet example. There's the filing cabinet itself that represents storing all the information. Then each cabinet might have one or more drawer, such as a computer might have one or more storage device. The filing cabinet also has directories and subdirectories and files, just as though you've seen on the computer file explorer. They even intentionally make the folders look like those old manila envelopes that would hang in a filing cabinet. So when you see a file in your file browser, you know to click on it to open the file. Then the computer needs to know where that file is located, actually located on the hard drive. Different operating systems use different types of filing systems, so each may find that file a, a different way. You ever have that hard drive that you've used forever in your Windows machine, then tried to plug it into your friend's Mac to share some files? Uh, no, of course not, Mrs. Murphy. We don't share files like that anymore. Well, anyway, pretend that you do. I have one. How's that? I have a, a hard drive that I store all my information on. And these are the properties of my hard drive. You can tell that the file system is NTFS. This is not quite going to work very well on a Mac or Linux machine. Compare that to this card, the properties for the card I have for my camera. That uses a file system called XFAT. This one's compatible with pretty much any computer device out there. It was designed with external storage devices in mind. Before we can talk about how filing systems work, you need to know a little bit about the hard drive. Hard drive has a platter that turns around on a spindle. There's a head attached to an arm that reads the information on the disk. That platter is where the data is stored, and it has different rings of information called tracks. Some tracks are larger than others depending on where they are on the hard drive. If it's towards the center, it's a little bit smaller. If it's towards the outside, it's a little bigger. Now the hard drive's organized into different wedges called disk sectors. Okay, each section in that sector on a particular track is called a track sector. Data is stored among several track sectors that are clumped together called clusters. And if you put that all together, here's the diagram of the entire hard drive. The first Windows file management system used a file allocation table, or FAT, to locate files on the hard drive. They started out with FAT, and then FAT16, and then there's FAT, we're now at FAT32. The file system separates the disk into different areas, or partitions, of information. The first area is the boot record, which is only one sector. Then there is a file allocation table, which I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but for now there's also a backup of that file allocation table. Then there's the root directory, and that's where the very first directory of files are located. And then the last area is the data area, and that's actually where the data is stored on the file, on the hard drive. So this is how the FAT allocation table file system works. There are two types of file contents. There's a directory, and then there's a file allocation table, or FAT. The directory lists all the files and folders that you have on the drive, as well as the starting memory address where the file is located. The file allocation table is a list of memory addresses where the data is stored in memory. 
So now we just have a starting location. We don't have an ending location. We don't have a size. Instead, there's a special character that represents the end of file. In this case, I'm going to use EOF to represent end of file, but really it's some sort of hex value. So take a look at the first file in the directory. It's called song.mp3, and it starts on cluster 1. I have this color coded so you can see easier, but really the computer doesn't really color code this anyway. But Anyway, so if we look at the fat, we could see in position 1, there's an EOF, or end of file. So we can tell that this file starts in cluster 1, and it also ends in cluster 1. If we look in cluster 1 in the data, you can see the actual data for the file. As soon as the file ends, there are just zeros for the unallocated or space or not used data. Now take a look at the second file in the directory, myfile.txt. It starts on address 3, and if we look at address 3 in the FAT, there is a location for address 4. So if we look at address 4, there's a, lo a location for address 5. And in 5, there's an end of file. So this particular file is larger. It's taking up a few more clusters than the first file. It's stored in clusters 3, 4, and 5. Now let's take a look at the file name, funnycat.jpg. Starts on cluster 6, and 6 is linked to 7. But if we look at the fat in cluster 7, it skips ahead to 10. These memory addresses are in hex, so 0a has the value 10. The file ends in cluster 10, or 0a. So this file skips around a bit, and it's not stored in it, it sequentially completely. It's stored in 6, 7, and 10. OK, what if we open up myfile.txt and we add some more paragraphs in our text file? And well, that data's got to go somewhere, so our end of file now becomes the location for the next cluster of information. So adding information to the hard drive is actually pretty easy. OK, just a little review of data structures. We have a data structure here that's non-contiguous in memory, where each piece of data is linked to the le next. Adding and removing is pretty easy. Do you remember from the last chapter what type of data structure this is? Did you say linked list? That's correct. The fat table is kind of like a table that stores all the heads of a bunch of linked lists. When you delete a file from your system, the entry gets removed from the directory, and the fat table has reallocates that position, sets it back to zeros or whatever. But if you look at the data area in the hard drive, the file information is still there. You, as a user, cannot see, the, see it in the file structure, but the data doesn't actually get deleted. Now, from a forensic or a file recovery point of view, that's a pretty good feature. So it's pretty easy to recover the information. As more files get added to the system, the data will eventually get rewritten. So timing is pretty crucial in file recovery. Now, as you continue to add, delete, and resave files from your hard drive, the files start to be put in fragmented pieces all over the place. File may no longer be contiguous on the hard drive. Well, this slows down the performance a bit. And most computers provide some sort of disk defragmenter utility to reorganize the clusters back into order. This puts the files sequentially on the disk, and it speeds up your hard drive regardless of which file system you may be using. So some of the advantages of the FAT file system is its efficient use of disk space. It just puts pieces of the file wherever there's room. If you delete a file from your hard drive, it only deletes the entry from the FAT table, and the data is stored in the data section until another file writes over the top of it. So it's pretty easy to recover missing files just by running a special program to find the, datas, find the data in the data section. Now, some of the problems with the FAT file system is it does run a little slower the more files that are added to the disk. Uh, there's no security on the drive, so anyone can plug that hard drive in and access your data. A FAT file system tends to have file integrity problems as well as lost clusters or invalid files. To overcome some of the limitations of the FAT file system, the New Technology File System, or NTFS, was developed. They really have difficulty naming their, their filing systems, don't they? Anyway, it was first introduced with Windows NT. 
And NTFS works in the similar way that FAT does with storing data, but they store data in a master file table. Instead of storing the, storing the starting location and having limited information like the FAT does, it stores more information about the file, including any transaction that has been done to the file, such as editing or moving the file. For this reason, NTFS is known as the journaling file system. It keeps record of everything going on with the files. Some of the advantages of NTFS over the FAT file system is it's super fast, it's reliable. Because of that journaling feature, it's pretty easy to recover data as well. The system just rolls back those transactions until it reaches a, a working situation. There is some security features that were not available with FAT. And now the problem with NTFS is it does require a lot more disk space, especially with all that journaling that gets stored. Uh, there is a little bit of compression that's available on the hard drive to save you some space, but it is still kind of bulky. It wastes a lot of space in the way it structures the disk. Because of this, you don't want to use the file, this particular file system on a small, imp uh, small data, like a flash drive or some sort of chip. Uh, it also doesn't work on any older operating systems, it, and it only operates well with Windows. So if you have a Mac or a Linux system, it's not going to work very well with that. You can tell in the file allocation table what type of information is being stored. If it's text files or any other type of ASCII data, we know there's going to be exactly 8-bit characters. So it would just take one ASCII character, one after another, and you could view the file just by converting it from the ASCII. Notepad allows you to view the ASCII of a file. If you open up any ASCII file, you can actually read what all the text that you're viewing. It's the exact translation of the ASCII characters. Now, have you ever accidentally opened up a picture in Notepad? You're not going to be able to mu understand much of what's going on. In fact, there might be weird characters you haven't even seen before. Uh, the reason for this is this is an example of a binary file. Binary files include programs or EXE files, images and sound files. Those are all examples of binary files. There are different ways to store information on a memory or on a drive so that the information can be retrieved. This next section will talk about sequential access, random access, and hashing. I'm going to compare sequential access with the best example I know. Think of those old VHS cassettes you used to watch when you were a kid. You can play it from the beginning to the end and watch the entire movie. Then if you want to watch it again, you got to spend the next five minutes of your life waiting for that dang thing to remind. Uh, it's stored sequentially on the cassette. If you want to go to the next scene, you can't just jump there. You have to fast forward through the tape until you get to your desired point. This is an example of a sequential access data. If you want to access the middle of the data, you first have to traverse through the first part of the data. We've already talked a little about sequential access files when we learned a linked list. In order to get to the data in the middle of the list, you have to traverse the list starting from the head of the linked list. Random access data is not stored in order, but it has fixed length records. This enables the computer to skip directly to the data in the middle without having to access every single item before it. Okay, so now we're going to compare our VHS cassette to a DVD. In a DVD, we can skip to any scene we want. We don't have to rewind the movie when we're done. We just skip back to the beginning. A DVD can do this because the data is stored in tracks, and each track has a fixed size. One scene in a movie might use several tracks, or not even one, but the next scene will be saved on the next track in the disc. In the last chapter, we talked about an array. You could access any data in the array just by its position value. This is an example of random access. This is also the reason that an array must contain all of the same data so it can be all a fixed length record. Okay, what if you need to store data that's not a fixed size and you still want to search for it have random access. Random access file would waste a lot of space beca if, because each piece of data is a fixed size and not all of your variable size data will fit in that fixed size, um, and whatever that fixed size is. A sequential access file would be very slow at retrieving the data. So an alternate is to use hashing. 
Hashing takes the data and it runs it through a hash function in order to generate a hash key for each record. The hash key is then used as a key value in a list of records of, or information. The hash key maps our value to a particular index in the hash table. So the hash function determines where the data is stored in the list. Now, it's usually a little bit more complex than 0 through 9. Usually they have a lot more information in the table and the, and than there is data, actually. So the list that you use for hash, your hash table, has to be able to store more information than the data that you're going to be storing in it. Okay, we're going to demonstrate with a super simple hash. We're going to use the first character in the in the string to represent where it's going to hash to. So if we put apple in our hash function, we're going to get zero. So apple is going to be stored in the first position in the list. Okay, now let's add grapes to our hash table. Grapes would have the hash value of, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, seventh letter of the alphabet, so it would have the hash value six. You know, we start counting at zero and all. So we're going to put grapes into position six into our hash table. Okay, banana, the easy one, that goes right next to apple because you know, B, second letter in the alphabet, goes in the second position. Okay, this time let's do a search. Let's see if cantaloupe exists in the list. So all we have to do is generate the hash value for cantaloupe, check the position where it should be in our list. So with one check, we can tell that cantaloupe is or is not in the list. In this case, it's not. Compare that to a sequential or even a binary ser search. It's going to be super efficient. Okay, I'm going to put cantaloupe in the list anyway. Okay, now let's do a tricky one. We want to add cherries to the list. Since we're using the first letter, it has the hash value of 2. Well, we already have cantaloupe in that position. This is what's called a collision. There are different ways to handle collisions in hashing, but you're going to have an entire class dedicated to data structures, so we're not going to go into it by now. So as you can see, hashing can be super efficient for adding and searching data. As a matter of fact, for most databases, they use hashing to store their information. This is why the primary key in a database is so important. It's used for the hash algorithm and helps prevent collisions. Well, that's it for this week. Message me if you have any questions or concerns, and good luck with homework assignment.